Good morning and welcome to uh, Newcastle Fellowship Baptist Church's virtual service this morning. Um, I'd invite you where you're at uh, in your homes to uh, worship with us this morning and you'll hear a great word um, given to you after us. And uh, we're going to start off with a, a song, Everlasting God. So join your hearts and worship with us. Strength will rise as we wait upon the moon. We'll wait upon the moon. We'll wait upon the moon. Strength will rise as we wait upon the moon. We'll wait upon the moon. We'll wait upon the moon. Our God, you wait forever. Our hope, our song.
Good morning. Our scripture reading this morning is taken from Psalm 46. Psalm 46. So if you could grab your Bibles at home and follow along. Beginning at verse 1. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, Though the mountains tremble at its swelling, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. Come, behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the end of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I will be exalted in the earth. The Lord of hosts is with us. The God of Jacob is our fortress. So far, the reading of God's Word. So we're going to teach you a new song this morning. Uh, this song is called Christ, Our Hope in Life and Death. Um, we are bringing this song in kind of in view of Easter time, when of the Trinity, we like to focus on Christ and His burial, His resurrection, and, and how that brings us hope. So first, we're going to teach you the chorus. Um, to kind of get you familiar with this song, and then we'll sing it all the way through together. Just like that, that's our chorus. And uh, this song gives the Christian hope that we actually have 
whether it's in this world or in the world to come, we have a hope in Christ that nothing could take away. And in light of the world that we see today, that so uh, rings true for us in that we have this eternal hope that we can rest in and, uh, and give our souls strength. So let's sing it together. Welcome to our service this morning. If you have your Bibles, please turn with me to the text that was read earlier on, Psalm 46, 
Psalm 46. And as you're doing that, let me just remind you that this coming Friday is Good Friday and we will have a service at 1030 in the morning and we will be having communion at that service. So I'd encourage you in your homes to have some bread, some juice so that we can celebrate the Lord's Supper together. Also, we'll be having a service next Sunday morning uh, at 1030 again. God bless you for that. Let's just uh, begin by opening up in a word of prayer and asking the Lord to be with us this morning. Father, we come before you this morning. We want to thank you and praise you so, so much for the fact that you are the sovereign king. Lord, I do pray that as we study your word this morning, that you would speak to us, that you would encourage us and strengthen us and challenge us and give us the grace we need, Father, to put our faith and trust in you. Lord, in these difficult days, sometimes we're so confused. We don't know what, why things are happening. We don't know what, what's gonna, what the outcome is going to be. But, Father, we know that you're in control. And I do pray that you would take this psalm, Lord, as we listen to it, as we, as we hear what, what the psalm says, that you would strengthen us in our hearts, that you would transform us in our lives, that we would leave this morning after being together as your people, encouraged, Lord, established deeper and deeper in our understanding. Father, we give you all the glory and the praise for who you are, and we want to love you more, we want to trust you better. Speak, I pray, Lord, and we'll give you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Quite a few years ago, there was a professor at Union Theological Seminary in Richmond, Virginia, who while lecturing to his students quoted Romans 8, verse 28. It says, And we know that in all things God works for the good of those who love him, who have been called according to his purpose. Well, in the discussion that followed, one of the students said, But professor, you don't really believe that all things work together for the good of those who love God, do you? All the pain, all the suffering, and all the misery. You don't really believe that all these things are really good for us, do you? Well, the professor listened intently, and then he said this. The things in themselves are not good, but hurtful. They're difficult in trying, but God takes those bad things, and he works them out for our spiritual good and welfare. Before the day was over, that professor's wife was tragically killed in a car accident, and he himself was left paralyzed as a result of the very same accident. And when the president of the seminary came by to visit him, the professor said this, Tell my students that Romans 8 verse 28 still stands. It's still true. Before the year was over, the professor himself died. And on, him, on his tombstone, the following words were inscribed. And we know that in all things, God works for the good of those who love him, who've been called according to his purpose. Trials and tragedies are nothing new in human history, are they? Suffering and pain and sorrow and loss and fear and doubt, anxiety, even despair have all been a constant part of the human story ever since Adam and Eve fell in the Garden of Eden. And yet alongside all the hurt of human history, there's been an abiding hope. A hope that above all the tragedies of this life, there's a truth that somehow makes sense out of a world that sometimes seems to be so senseless. The truth that we all cling to as believers in Jesus Christ in times of great human tragedy is that God is who he says he is and that he's sovereignly at work in our world even when we can't see it or understand it or even explain it. That's the truth that's revealed to us in Scripture. And it's a truth that has sustained the hearts of all God's people whenever they've had to face times of trouble or distress. Psalm 46 is such a great psalm. It's a psalm in which we're reminded of the person and presence and power and protection of our great and awesome God. He never changes. He alone is our refuge and strength. And some people think that they're going to be secure if they have enough money. And so they lay it all up in bank accounts and in stocks and in other tangible assets. But money is such a poor protector when tragedies strike. It can't save us from the disasters or distresses of this life. I mean, these last few weeks have certainly confirmed that. Other people think they're going to be secure because of their specialized training or their skills or personal talents. But even the most educated and highly skilled of individuals still suffer from the problems and pains of this life. None of us are immune from disease, distress, or disaster. None of us are untouched, not even the precious children of God. And still others expect to find their security in their families or in their friends or in their business associates. But these are all human supports. 
They're uncertain at the best of times, and even they can suddenly be swept away from us. We all know that to be true. The Bible says, what is your life? It's like a vapor that appears for a time, and then it's gone. The reformers knew how uncertain and unstable all these things could be. They knew that God alone is the only unshakable and trustworthy rock. They knew that he alone is the only stronghold in which we can all flee. And they knew that sometimes God does shield us from everything that's going on around us so that it can be said of us, a thousand will fall at your side, ten thousand at your right hand, but it will not come near you. They knew that. But the reformers also knew that at other times we are afflicted and we do suffer loss. And that that it's then during those hard and difficult times of life that you and I can all cry out, God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Friends, we can seldom read verses like these without thinking of people like Elizabeth Elliot. She suffered great losses in her life. She suffered the loss of two husbands, the first Jim Elliot, who was killed by Aka Indians in Ecuador while he was trying to reach him with the gospel of Jesus Christ. And then second, Addison Leach, who was slowly consumed by cancer. And in relating what those experiences were like for her, she referred to this psalm and she said this, that everything that has seemed most dependable has given way. She said, mountains are falling, the earth is reeling in such a time as this. It is a profound comfort to know that although all things seem to be shaken, one thing is not. God is not shaken. And then she added, the most important thing we could all do in times of difficulty and distress is to be still and know that He is God. Do we not need to be reminded of this great truth once again this morning? Do we not need to hear these words once more? We all know, friends, how unstable and unsure life can be. We all know that sooner or later the bottom is going to fall out and the landmarks are all going to disappear and the unexpected is going to come and life will suddenly and unexpectedly take such a drastic turn. What then? What can we do when life begins to fall apart? Where can we turn? On whom can we lean? Where can hope ultimately be found? What's the answer? Well, there's a light of all the uncertainty we're each facing in these difficult days that I want to take a fresh look at Psalm 46. And I want to remind you this morning of three different truths that I know and trust will uphold you and sustain you whenever it is that life gets really hard. And sometimes life does get hard. Number one, We have a father that gives us help. And number two, we have a future that gives us hope. And number three, we have a faith that gives us heart. So first of all then, when life gets really hard and when all the landmarks begin to disappear, I want you to know that we have a father who gives us help. Look at verse one. What does it say? God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Praise God. What a great verse that is. We're not really sure what the occasion was that precipitated the writing of this helpful psalm, but two different suggestions have been made. Number one, one theory suggests that Psalm 46 was written in response to a terrifying situation in the life of King Jehoshaphat. You read about that incident in 2 Chronicles chapter 20. King Jehoshaphat was a very godly and righteous king. One day he looked out over the horizon and he saw three mighty armies coming together towards the nation of Judah. And after a quick investigation, it was determined that the Moabites and the Amorites and the Munites had formed this alliance together and they were determined to attack and plunder the people of God. They were determined to wipe them off the face of the earth. Now, King Jehoshaphat was terrified. He knew that there was no way, humanly speaking, no way whatsoever that the nation of Judah could ever defeat these great enemies that were coming against him with the tiny, small, and ill-equipped army that that they had. They would have all been destroyed and, and annihilated. And so what did he do? The Bible tells us that he turned to the Lord and he prayed. 2 Chronicles 20 verse 12 says it like this. Oh, our God, will you not judge them? For we have no power to face this vast army that is attacking us. No power. We can't defeat them, he's saying. We do not know what to do, but our eyes are upon you. Jehoshaphat was terrified. 
He was under great pressure and stress. He knew that no human support could rescue him from what he was about to face. And so he turned to the Lord and he proclaimed a fast in Judah. And in response to his faith, the Lord gave him the following message. 2 Chronicles 20, 15. Listen, King Jehoshaphat, and all who live in Judah and Jerusalem, this is what the Lord says to you. Do not be afraid or discouraged because of this vast army, for the battle is not yours, but God's. Hallelujah. For the following day when King Jehoshaphat and the armies of Judah went out to meet their enemies as they crested the hill and looked down on the enemy camp, all they saw were dead bodies. It looked as if a great battle had already taken place, and it had. During the night, God had confused the enemy soldiers so much that they started to attack one another and they all slaughtered each other. God had saved his people. And so the first series suggests that it was this amazing deliverance from God that moved King Jehoshaphat's music minister to pen the words of Psalm 46. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. The second theory suggests that Psalm 46 was written during the reign of King Hezekiah, another godly and righteous king around the year 700 B.C., Sennacherib and his Assyrian armies invaded the nation of Judah. They'd surrounded the city of Jerusalem. They were planning on taking the city. And Sennacherib boldly defied the Lord in the presence of his people. And he told them that God would not be able to protect them. This is what he says. He says to the people of Judah, he says, Do not listen to Hezekiah, for he's misleading you when he says the Lord will deliver us. Has the God of any nation ever delivered his land from the hand of the king of Assyria? Where are the gods of Amoth and Arpad? Where are the gods of Shephervaim and Hina and Iva? Have they rescued Samaria from my hand? Who of all the gods of these countries has been able to save his land from me? How then can the Lord deliver Jerusalem from my hand? You speak of arrogance and pride there. No one can save me, you from, from my power. But then Sennacherib quickly learned that Yahweh was nothing like the gods of the other nations. He quickly learned that God alone is sovereign, that God alone is a king eternal and immortal. King Hezekiah cried out to the Lord, and that very night the Lord sent one angel who killed 185,000 Assyrian soldiers. The Bible says it like this. And Hezekiah prayed to the Lord, O Lord God of Israel, enthroned between the cherubim, you alone are God over all the kingdoms of the earth. You've made heaven and earth. Give ear, O Lord, and hear. Open your eyes, O Lord, and see. Listen to the words of Sennacherib that he has sent to insult the living God. It is true, O Lord, that the Assyrian kings have laid waste these nations and their lands. They have thrown their gods into the fire and destroyed them, for they were not gods, but only wood and stone fashioned by the hands of men. Now, O Lord, our God, deliver us from his hand so that the kingdoms on earth may know that you, O Lord, are alone our God. And that's exactly what God did. See, it doesn't matter which year you hold to, whether Psalm 46 was written after God's deliverance of King Jehoshaphat or whether it was written after God's deliverance of King Hezekiah. The point is this. Both of these men put their trust in the Lord and this psalm was written to proclaim God's mighty deliverance of them at such a crucial and critical time in their lives. Guys, nowhere does the Bible ever promise us the absence of trouble this side of heaven. Nowhere. The Bible says man who is born of woman is a few days and full of trouble. The Bible says consider it pure joy, my brothers, whenever you face trials of many kinds. Guys, listen to me. We are all going to face our trials. We're all going to face our hardships. And while God does not always promise us that he's going to spare us from those troubles, he has certainly given us the assurance that we won't have to face those troubles on our own. In John chapter 14, Jesus promised his anxious disciples, I will not leave you as orphans. He said, I will come to you. The Bible says in Isaiah 41, so do not fear for I am with you. Do not be dismayed for I am your God. I will strengthen you and help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. In all our times of difficulty, God is with us. And we won't have to face any of our trials on our own. And that's exactly what the psalmist is saying in this psalm. He's describing the kind of help it is that the Father always gives us. First, he tells us that God's power aids us in times of distress. Psalm 46 verse 1 teaches us that our help doesn't come from any earthly source 
or from any human ally. That is not where it resides. It is God who's our refuge and strength. It's God alone who gives us help. That's what the text says. Now, what does that word refuge make us think of? Maybe an imposing building with locks on the doors, or maybe a thick wall fortress, or something as simple as a canopy to keep us dry in the middle of a rainstorm. Now, whatever picture comes to our minds, it can be agreed upon that a refuge is a place of shelter. It's protection in times of danger or distress. It's comfort in times of fear and sorrow. Listen, guys, our refuge is our safe place. That's what it is. And so when the Bible describes God as our refuge, it's saying that God is our safe place whenever we need protection from something, whether it's danger, distress, discouragement, despair, depression, disaster, disease, or even death. We don't need to be afraid of situations that threaten to undo us. We don't need to fear the difficult days of life that lie ahead of us. There is no situation in life that you and I will ever face that lies outside of God's sovereign control. And so the best place for us to be is where? It's in his presence. Right there at his side. The Bible says it like this. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous man runs into it and he is safe. I'm so thankful this morning that we have a God that we can run to. We have a God that we can turn to and cling to when no other help is available. Are you not thankful for that? And the Bible not only says that God is his people's refuge, but also says that God is his people's strength. Strength. In other words, although our strength is so quickly drained and depleted, and even though it's so often insufficient to see us through the darkest of times, it's God's strength which becomes that which carries you and me through the difficult days of our lives. Guys, listen to me. Human strength will always fail us in times of uncertainty. But the Bible says this in Isaiah 40. He gives strength to the weary and increases the power of the weak. Even youths grow tired and weary, and young men stumble and fall. But those who wait upon and the Lord shall what? Shall renew their strength. They will mount up with wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. I don't know what lies ahead of us, either individually or corporately, in these difficult and unprecedented times. But I do know that whatever comes our way, beloved, we have a Father whose power will always, always, always aid us in times of trouble and distress. And not only do we have a Father whose power will always aid us, but we also have a Father whose presence will always assure us. Let me read the first three verses again. God is our refuge and strength, a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear, though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam, though the mountains tremble at its swelling. What's the psalmist describing there? He's describing a world that's being torn apart, much like ours is right now. He's describing a universe where the earth is being removed and where the mountains are falling into the heart of the seas and where the waters are all being stirred up and troubled. It's not a very safe place to be. In fact, let me suggest to you that the world that the psalmist is describing here is a very dangerous place to be. And yet in spite of all of that, the psalmist says this, we will not fear. <laughs> Praise God, we will not fear. Fear, in spite of all the danger that surrounds us, in spite of all the destruction that's piling up around us, we will not be afraid. That was the psalmist's confidence. It can also be our very own. We won't be afraid. There are all kinds of different things that we fear in life, isn't there? We all fear the impossibilities of life. Maybe this morning you're facing a physical problem. There's something suspicious that's been revealed to you in a recent x-ray. And your doctor's report has turned your whole world upside down. Maybe this morning you're facing a financial problem. There's more month in your life than there is money. You've been laid off. You feel like you're on the verge of losing everything that you work so hard for. Circumstances beyond your control that put you between a rock and a hard place. You have no idea how you're going to be able to make ends meet. And it's driving you insane with worry. Maybe you're facing a marital problem. The marriage you believe would last a lifetime now seems to be falling apart at the seams. 
You've tried counseling and everything else you can think of, but nothing seems to be working. Nothing seems to be making anything better. The problems are still all there. And now he or she has left, and you're standing there alone, all by yourself, wondering at how the rest of your life is going to look like. Or maybe you're facing a parental problem. A son or a daughter that has been the pride of your life has now turned their back on everything that you value, on everything that you've ever taught them. They've done, you've done everything you can to reason with them and to plead with them, but they just won't listen to you. They're not hearing you. They've resolved to go their own way, and you begin to see them drifting further and further away, and you just don't know what to do. You feel like you're backed up into a corner where escape seems to be an impossible thing and you feel pressed on every side where your options have become so limited and your resources have all run dry. Guys, listen to me. We all fear the impossibilities of life. We also all fear the innovations of life, do we not? We all fear change. Isn't that what was happening in the nation of Judah either in the days of King Jehoshaphat or King Hezekiah? Fierce foreign armies were threatening Jerusalem and the face of Judah would never be the same again. Their lives would forever be changed. Guys, listen to me. We all hate change. We feel threatened by it because change causes us to lose our sense of security and control and we don't like to feel like that. We all want to be in charge. We also all feel the insecurities of life. Look at verse 2 and 3 again. It says, Therefore we will not fear. Though the earth gives way, though the mountains be moved into the heart of the sea, though its waters roar and foam and the mountains tremble at its swelling. Guys, most of us would consider mountains to be one of the strongest and most dependable and lasting things on this planet. Right? Just think of the Rockies. But even if the mountains were to sink into the oceans and cause the seas to respond in massive, angry waves like tsunamis, the whole point of the psalmist's words is that we don't have to be afraid, beloved. We can still depend and trust in our faithful, sovereign, all-powerful God. He is not moved. Remember the words of Elizabeth Elliot. She said, everything that has seemed most dependable has given way. Mountains are falling. The earth is reeling in such a time as this. It is a profound comfort to know that although things seem to be shaken, one thing is not. God is not shaken. And therefore, we will not fear. We won't be afraid. With the hymn writer, we can sing, What have I to dread? What have I to fear? Leaning on the everlasting arms. I have blessed peace with my Lord so near. Leaning on the everlasting arms arms. We can never forget that in times of deep distress, danger, or difficulties, we have a Father whose power will always aid us and whose presence will always assure us. Listen, guys, God is our refuge and strength. He is a very present help in trouble. That is a fact. It is a gospel fact. It is a theological maxim. It will not change. God, my beloved, is our refuge and strength. He is that very present help in trouble. Praise God for that. As we look a little deeper into the psalm, not only do we see that we have a Father that gives us help, but we also see that we have a future that gives us hope. I want you to look at verses 4 to 6. Let me read those three verses. There is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. The nations rage. The kingdoms totter. He utters his voice. The earth melts. Even though everything around him seemed to be falling completely apart, The writer of this psalm was looking forward to a place that's never going to be in danger of damage or decay. He speaks about the city of God. And when he does that, he's not describing the ancient city of Jerusalem, but he's describing the new Jerusalem, right? That beautiful, wonderful, supernatural, heavenly city of the living God. He says, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God. And then he says this, the holy habitation of the Most High. Because one of the greatest dangers and fears of an ancient city in a time of crisis was that its water supply would run dry, that they wouldn't have enough water to sustain them or keep them alive. And that's why the psalmist begins describing this heavenly city of God by saying this, there is a river. There is a river, and that river is never going to be cut off. That river will never run dry. 
What's the point? The point is simply this. We have a future in heaven that always gives us such a blessed hope in time, no matter what our present circumstances might be like. We're looking forward to a city that is not built by human hands. That's why the Apostle Peter would say this. Therefore, prepare your minds for action. Be self-controlled. Set your hope fully on the grace to be given you when Jesus Christ is revealed. That's how we're supposed to live. By setting our hope fully on the grace that will be given to us when we see Jesus. That's why the Bible says of Abraham in Hebrews chapter 11 that he was looking forward to the city with foundations whose architect and builder is God. That's the blessed hope of every single believer. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. And David says, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Let me share three things with you about that amazing city. First of all, the psalmist tells us that it's a glad place. As we look around at all the troubles of this life, it's so hard sometimes to make any sense of the things that we suffer. We just don't get it. We we just can't see. We just don't understand. We all find ourselves asking the very same question that so many people have, other people have asked. Why? 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 And yet, as we wipe all those tears away from our eyes, We know that if Jesus Christ is the Lord and Savior and King of our lives, that there's a day that's coming when you and I are going to inherit a kingdom in which sorrow and sadness will be as foreign as the trouble that brings them. Psalm 46 verse 4 says, There is a river whose streams make glad that city of God. In Revelation chapter 21, the Apostle John tells us a little bit more about that city that's called the glad place. Listen to what he says. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride beautifully dressed for a husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, now the dwelling of God is with men and he will live with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. Isn't that a glorious place? Isn't that a beautiful place? He will wipe away every tear from our eyes. There'll be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. Praise God, guys. That is such a glad place. And not only is that future place that gives us so much hope, a glad place, but the psalmist says it's also a glorious place. Look at verse 5. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. Friends, the thing that's going to make heaven so glorious and so beautiful is not its streets that are paved with gold. It's not its pearly gates or its jasper walls or its many mansions or its, its angelic and awesome uh, angel, angelic beings. It's not anything like that. The thing that's going to make heaven so glorious and so beautiful is the fact that God is in the midst of her. It's the fact that his throne will be the centerpiece of that city and his son Jesus Christ will be the light and delight of that city. It's like I've said so many times before. Let the greatest surprises of the future come, but there never has arisen and neither shall there ever arise any other person like Jesus Christ. Socrates taught for 40 years. Aristotle taught for 40 years, Plato taught for 50 years, and Jesus only taught for three years. Yet the influence of Christ's three-year ministry infinitely transcends the impact of the combined 130 years of teaching from those three men who are considered to be among the greatest philosophers who ever lived on this planet. Jesus never painted any pictures. Yet some of the finest paintings that have ever been seen by the eyes of men have all received their inspiration from his precious person. Jesus never composed any music, but the songs and the hymns and the praises of thousands upon thousands have all sounded his glorious name. And friends, Jesus never wrote a book, but this world could never contain the amount of volumes that have all been written about his very short life. Charles Lamb once said, if William Shakespeare were to walk into this room, everybody would stand. But if Jesus Christ were to walk into this room, everybody would bow. Jesus Christ is Lord. And that's what's going to make heaven so glorious and so beautiful. Jesus is going to be there. Hallelujah. Just think about it. 
Fairest Lord Jesus, ruler of all nature, O thou of God and man the Son, thee will I cherish, thee will I honor, thou my soul's glory, joy, and crown. Fair are the meadows, fair are still the woodlands, robed in the blooming garb of spring. Jesus is fair, Jesus is pure, who makes the woeful heart to sing. Fair is the sunshine, fair is still the moonlight, and all the twinkling starry hosts. Jesus shines brighter, Jesus shines shines purer than all the angels heaven can boast. The thing that's going to make heaven so glorious and so wonderful is the fact that God is in the midst of her. It's the fact that his throne is going to be the centerpiece of that city. And it's the fact that his son, Jesus Christ, is going to be the light and delight of that city. And not only is it that future place that brings us so much hope, a glad place, and a glorious place, but the psalmist also tells us that it's a guarded place. Take a look at verse five once more. Listen to what it says. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. God will help her when morning dawns. I love the phrase that's in the middle of that verse. She shall not be moved. Today, we live in cities and we dwell in nations in which so much can be moved and blown away by the storms and tragedies of this life. But the city to which we're going will never be moved. It's never going to be shaken. It's never going to fall apart or be destroyed. The Bible says, praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he's given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. An inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade. Kept in heaven for you who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that's ready to be revealed in the last time. Hallelujah. Now why will that city not be moved? Why will it never be shaken or destroyed? It's because God is in the midst of her. It's because God himself will help her. While the present might be very difficult and hard and uncertain for so many of us here, we have a future that gives us such a blessed hope. We're looking forward to a place that's never going to be in danger of damage or decay. It's the city of God. It's not the ancient city of Jerusalem, but the heavenly city of the new Jerusalem. A city that's described to us as a glad place and is a glorious place and is a guarded place and friends in light of that beautiful city you and I must press on we need to go forward we must not be discouraged we must live life in light of the hope of the inheritance of that great city never moved never shaken never in despair by the impossibilities innovations or insecurities of this present life I've got one more point that I want to share with you from this psalm. With this point, I'm going to close. Not only do we see that we have a father that gives us help and a future that gives us hope, we also see that we have a faith that gives us heart. Look at verses 8 to 10. Let me read them. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. He makes wars cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. Now there's a command that requires great faith. Especially now that we know the context in which this psalm was written. And yet it's a faith that if we possess it, will give us all the courage and strength we need whenever it is that we have to face the significant tragedies of this life. There are two things that we need to notice about this faith. Number one, I want you to think about the way in which this faith behaves. Take a look at verse 8. Come behold the works of the Lord, how he has brought desolations on the earth. Isn't that an amazing verse? A strange verse? Behold the works of the Lord. How He has brought desolations on the earth. That word translated desolations has as its root the idea of ruin and destruction. Yes, friends, there might be times in this life when God's decree permits destruction and desolation in our lives. We can never fully disconnect the sovereign God from anything that happens in this world. Remember the words of Job. He says, I know you can do all things and no purpose of yours can be thwarted. He said, naked I came from my mother's womb. Naked will I depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. 
We might not know the reasons behind everything that God does, but we do know that he's a sovereign God. He's the God, according to Psalm 42, verse 8, that brings desolations on the earth. And then take a look at verse 9. It says, he makes war cease to the ends of the earth. He breaks the bow and shatters the spear. He burns the chariots with fire. Now, what's the psalmist saying in these two verses? He's telling us that not only does God bring about desolations upon this earth, but he also makes wars to cease. And he breaks the weapons of all the armies by his almighty power. So what's the point? The main point is simply this. Look at everything God does. Listen, look at everything God does. Both the things that seem destructive and the things that seem productive. And when you look at all those things, remember that God speaks and he says this, Be still and know that I am God. Instead of running around questioning all the mysteries of God's sovereign ways, asking yourself what he's doing and why he's doing it, just be still. Simply get a hold of yourself, calm yourself down, and know in your heart that He is God. I think the challenge here for me is to overcome all of my questions and confusions about the events of this life by resting in the knowledge that you and I serve an omniscient, omnipotent, omnipresent, and omnisapient God who's in control. The challenge, I think, is to say with the Apostle Paul, oh, the depth of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God, how unsearchable are his judgment, how inscrutable his ways. Who has known the mind of the Lord? Who's been his counselor? Who's given a gift to him that he might be repaid for from him and through him and to him are all things. To him be glory forever. Amen. That is the challenge. In 1790, a writer by the name of Samuel Medley wrote a hymn entitled, God Shall Alone the Refuge Be. And part of the lyrics of that hymn says this, God shall alone the refuge be in comfort of my mind. Too wise to be mistaken, he too good to be unkind. In all his holy sovereign will he is ideally find. Too wise to be mistaken still, too good to be unkind. That's our God. That's who he is. We can believe him. And not only do I want us to think about the way that this faith behaves, but I also want us to think about the word that this faith believes. Look at verse 10. It's an amazing verse. Be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. Guys, the command of God here is accompanied by the promise of God. Right Here's the command. Be still and know that I'm God. That's the command. And here's the promise. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. In other words, guys, listen to me. When everything is said and done, when all the work of God is finally completed, he himself will be exalted in this earth and his name alone will be glorified. Even the worst of tragedies can turn into a glorious victory all to the praise and glory of God. And do you want proof of that? Then just look at the cross. Look at the person and work of Jesus Christ. Look at Calvary. There the innocent Son of God hung naked, bleeding, beaten, tortured, mocked, ridiculed, and nailed to a tree. His disciples had all fled in fear. His enemies relentlessly accused him of being a false and weak Messiah. It all looked like a terrible tragedy, right? Those who loved him, those who trusted him, those who forsook everything they had to follow him, must have all stood there wondering to themselves, why, 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 what is God doing? Where is God now? He seems to be so indifferent, so inconsistent, so inactive. And yet, guys, we know that what looked like the worst of tragedies on Good Friday turned into the greatest of victories on Resurrection Sunday. Why? Because Jesus Christ rose again from the dead and beloved God was exalted in the earth. Knowing this truth and believing this truth that God's power is unlimited, that his person is unequaled, that his purpose is unstoppable, we can all pick up the broken pieces of our lives and we can look forward to what lies ahead in spite of all the fears and uncertainties that we might have to face. Even in the rubble and ruin of the greatest storms of our lives, you and I need to stop and we need to hear him say, Be still, Jacques. Be still, Will, be still, Kyle, and know that I am God. I will be exalted among the nations. I 
will be exalted in the earth. Do we really believe that? Beloved, do we? Do we really believe that we have a Father that gives us help? That we have a future that gives us hope? That we have a faith that gives us heart? Do we really believe, according to Psalm 46, verse 7, that the Lord of hosts is with us? The God of Jacob is our fortress? Do we really believe that he's going to be with us at the kitchen sink? And that he's going to be with us when we're driving through rush hour traffic to meet with that impossible boss? And that he's going to be with us in those dark and lonely hours of life when you and I feel all alone with no one else to help us? Do we really believe that? Do we honestly believe the words of Martin Luther when he wrote, A mighty fortress is our God, a bulwark never failing. Our helper, he amidst the flood of mortal ills prevailing. Do we believe that? Are you afraid this morning? Anxious about what the future holds? Uncertain about all the impossibilities of life? All the innovations of life and all the insecurities of life? Do you feel like life is falling apart all around you? Have the landmarks disappeared for you? Has the bottom completely fallen out? What then should you do? Well, you need to remember this. There is a refuge for you to hide in. There is a river for you to draw from. And there is a ruler for you to lean on. You have a father that gives you help. You have a future that gives you hope. And beloved, you have a faith that gives you heart. We don't need to be afraid. Be still and know that I am God. I'll be exalted among the nations. I'll be exalted in the earth. I will be exalted in your life. Let me encourage you as we look to the future to remember those three things. To remember that Father, to remember that future, and to remember that faith. Let's pray. Father, thank you and praise you so much for your glorious word. There is so much truth in this psalm that we all need to be reminded of, Father, that I need to be reminded of again this morning, that I need to cast my hope and strength and soul into, Father, these great and precious truths that never change, these great and precious truths that, that have sustained the hearts of all of your people down throughout the centuries. Father, you are our refuge. You are our strength. You are a very present help in trouble. Therefore, we will not fear. We will not be afraid. Even though the mountains fall into the heart of the seas, even though the waters are stirred up, there is a river whose streams make glad the city of God, the holy habitation of the Most High. God is in the midst of her. She shall not be moved. Be still and know that I am God. Lord, give us the grace. Give me the grace. Give us the grace as your people to be still and remember that you are God. To be still and remember that you're the one who brings desolations on the earth and you're the one who removes desolations from the earth. You are a sovereign king. Help us to rest there. Help us to rejoice there. Help us to live in light of that. Give us the grace, dear Father, to to deny ourselves, take up our crosses every single day and follow the Lord Jesus, fixing our hope on the glory that's to be revealed when Jesus Christ comes again. We love you, Lord. We trust you. We cast our cares upon you because you care for us. Strengthen us, sustain us, sanctify us, supply us. And Father, if there's anyone under the sound of my voice this morning who's not made a profession of faith in Christ, who's not turned from their sins, who's not trusted in in Jesus Christ as Lord, as Savior, and as King, I pray that even now, by the power of your Holy Spirit, you would bring them to the end of themselves. You'd give them the grace to look up to the crucified, risen Son. You'd give them the grace to put their trust only in Him and have the assurance that God is also their refuge and strength. We'll give you thanks for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen to that. He's our refuge and strength, and who's going to hold us fast? Jesus will hold us fast in times of trials and troubles in our lives.
I could never keep my hold through life's fearful path, for my love is often cold. Justice has been satisfied. 